Welcome to the Austrian mountains. Today I'm going to collect some ingredients, put them in the basket, and then go back to the hut where we're going to cook up some tasty food. I plan to make some waffles with a sweet syrup to go on top. And the syrup is going to be made from these trees all around us. Foraging wild food is definitely one of my favorite things to spend my time doing. I've just got this basket to put anything that I find in and then also a knife. So you just need something to cut either mushrooms or plants. So you really don't need much to go out and forage food. Also foraging is the perfect excuse for a walk in the woods. Just going for a walk is fun, but if you have a secondary aim for that walk, such as trying to find a certain species of mushroom or a particular type of berry, it makes the, the walk so much more interesting and meaningful, I find. Who would have thought mushroom foraging can bring a man so much happiness also, I think it's just the coolest thing ever to find food in the wild that you can take home and eat. So at the moment, it's pretty cold and there's not a huge amount of things growing. There's certainly very few mushrooms. So today's target species is this. We're not gonna take the whole tree, <laughs> just some of the, the needles that come from it. Now, this is a spruce. There's a number of different species of spruce. I believe this is a Norway spruce. The main thing is, is that I know that it's a spruce and not a deadly look-alike. Spruce trees everywhere. And I think they are the dominant species here because they're very uh, tough. They, c they can grow in not the best conditions. For example, these mountains are really rocky. Uh, the soils can't be that thick. And, and, but these trees just thrive and they're everywhere. I'd say the hardest part of foraging wild food is knowing what you're picking and identifying the species that you want to find. But this is also the most important thing because there are species of berry, fungi and plant that are poisonous and there are species which are very tasty and sometimes they look really similar. It happens every year, people eat the wrong mushroom and die. Sometimes it can be really hard to find the species that you're looking for, but luckily this is pretty easy. These spruce trees are everywhere. There's one species which kind of looks a little bit similar to spruce, which is in fact very poisonous and it's called yew. Now I can confirm that this is a very poisonous plant and I witnessed firsthand of the effects. My brother, for some odd reason, uh, once decided to eat a few leaves of you. Anyway, the following day he collapsed, had hallucinations and uh, was rushed to hospital. Luckily he didn't die, but if he had eaten like twice as many, then that could well have been the case. So sometimes it can be good to learn and ID not only the, the species that you want to find, but also the poisonous lookalikes. But once you start looking a little closer, you can very quickly realize that spruce is in fact very different looking to you but on first glance, it might look quite similar. Anyway, let's go and collect some of this stuff. Most people, I think, collect spruce in the spring when they have their fresh growth tips. These, I've heard, are a lot softer and you can actually eat them raw. Now, because we are very late on in the year, this is the growth that would have happened like throughout the spring and summer. So it's not really gonna be soft and nice to eat just like that. You make a few nibbles on the end and you get really acidic, sprucey, flavors in your mouth. It's a really interesting taste and on its own, yeah, I, it's not great, but this mixed into a syrup, like a sweet syrup, I reckon that's gonna be lovely. So I'm gonna grab my knife and then start cutting off the tips. Now it doesn't matter that these are old leaves and the texture isn't too great because we're not actually gonna eat the leaves. We're gonna extract the flavor from them and then we're gonna strain out the leaves afterwards. I'm gonna take a few spruce tips from each tree just so that I'm not taking everything from this poor tree here. I'm gonna find some others and do the same thing. These ones look like proper Christmas trees. I wonder if you get different flavors and different tastes from different age of tree. You think young ones, like normally young things are tastier. I really enjoy the smell as you walk through a spruce forest like this. I'll leave a link in the description to where you can find a proper ID video of how to identify the different types of 
conifer trees because spruce are very similar to fir. They have quite a few similar characteristics. But there's a few things you can spot on these which are different. Uh, and the main one is, is the cones. The cones actually hang down from the tree and I can see on the trees up there these long cones hanging down. And also spruce needles are spiky, so when you grab them, it's kind of uncomfortable. Uh, I think fur, they have a rounded edge, not a point. But like I said, I'll leave a link in the description to where you can learn more about these trees. Well, there's not many mushrooms about, but I just found one. Don't know what species it is, but it looks cold. I can't think of many things more cozy than an evening spent making syrup in a mountain hut whilst it's freezing cold outside. And that is the plan for tonight. We're gonna use some special cooking techniques to turn these spruce needles and some sugar into a really tasty syrup. So the plan is tomorrow morning, I'm gonna make waffles for breakfast and I'm gonna drizzle the spruce syrup that we're gonna make this evening over the top. And then with that, I want to have some banana chunks which I can dunk into some spruce caramel that I'm gonna make and it's gonna be crispy. So I'm gonna bite into a crispy outside layer of caramel which is coated around a ripe banana. That's the plan. Let's see if we can pull it off. I was given some instructions for this spruce syrup by a guy from the Netherlands. He's a pro chef called Laurens. Uh, so we're gonna follow those instructions closely. But I also wanted to do some research and learn a bit about this cooking technique that we're gonna use today called caramelization. Now this white sugar tastes like sugar. Something happens when you heat sugar to a certain temperature. Sucrose, which is uh, what this sugar that we get from the supermarket is made up of. It apparently starts to caramelize at 160 degrees C. So by heating this sugar, you can actually change the composition of the sugar. It starts to break down and turn into something which smells and looks very different. Now any food containing sugar, you can cook it and if you cook it for long enough at the right temperature, you can caramelize it. For example, caramelized onions. The other day I heated up a couple of onions in a pan, cooked it for about half an hour to an hour, and it went this beautiful golden color, like the sort of color of caramel, and it tasted a lot sweeter and different to onions that you just like fried for a couple of minutes. Step one, put a layer of sugar in a pan and add about the same amount of water. Boil the water and sugar in the pan until you get a dark caramel. So I'm gonna turn this on full power and we're just gonna heat it. This is my caramel spoon. To help keep an eye on the temperatures, I've got this temperature gun. It's 87 degrees. We want it to get to 160 before it starts to caramelize. So that might take a while. So I'm keeping myself occupied by munching on some paprika crisps. And I found this in the other room. Raspberry schnapps. Certainly smells nice. Yeah, not too bad. Ah! The raspberry flavoring is good though. Whoa, it's bubbling away. If I taste the sugar now, it'll just taste rather bland. But we give this some time to caramelize and the flavors go completely different. I did this for the first time the other day and really, really fascinating how the same thing, just some sugar, can have two incredibly different tastes just by heating it up. Step three, when you have caramel in the pan, remove it from the heat and add water again. Then I put in the spruce needles and cook it down until I have a syrup. Add some liquid, this might be a bit hectic. Then we're going to grab our spruce needles and pile it in there. We're going to heat it up again, let the flavour from the needles infuse into the water. Then when we have a nice syrup, I will strain it, so get rid of all these needles. It smells like a forest in here. 
It looks like the colour is gone from the leaves. They're no longer a nice green, they've gone brown. I've just got to wait for the water to evaporate. What's going on here is the flavour from the spruce needles is going into the water at the same time as the water is also being removed slowly to make the syrup thicker. But much like making salt from seawater, you evaporate the water, but that doesn't evaporate the salt. Here, the water is being evaporated, but the flavour from the spruce is staying in the syrup. I'm gonna start removing some of the spruce needles to make the straining process easier. So currently what we have in the pan is a spruce syrup, which is quite watery. I'm gonna keep reducing a little bit of water till it's more of a syrup, and then I'll strain it off. Interestingly, by testing the temperature of the caramel, you can tell how the texture will be once it's cooled. And the temperature of the caramel depends on how much water is in there. So between 149 degrees and 154 degrees, you have hard cracking caramel. 150, okay, we're gonna take the heat off. The caramel will get hotter if it has less water. And if it has less water, then the texture of the caramel, once it cools down, is going to be harder. And I believe this is the cooking technique that candy makers use to create candy with different textures. For example, a very soft, chewy sweet, you will have more water content than a really hard one that breaks and cracks when you bite into it. Banana. Dunked in the caramel. I'm trying a number of different ways of coating the bananas. It's a tricky thing, trying to coat them without the caramel going everywhere. My goodness, coating these bananas is so tricky. Look at that, it's a mess. Depending on the angle, it looks kind of artistic. So that's the spruce syrup and caramel coated banana chunks made. Tomorrow morning, I'm gonna wake up and make some waffles. See you tomorrow. Looking outside this morning, it seems like the snow is all melting, which is a bit sad. I like the snow. Anyway, it's not the end of the world because we're making waffles this morning. And these days I'm getting into a habit of making a plan. I'm going to make a batter to pour into the waffle iron. We're gonna hopefully get a really nice looking waffle. It's gonna hopefully look nicer than that. And we're gonna drizzle some spruce syrup over the top. We're gonna add some fruit as well. We're gonna have the bananas covered in like the crispy caramel. I think I'm gonna try a few more of those banana caramel things. Try a different technique for uh, coating them a bit, a bit better. Fork goes in, tip the caramel up, dunk it quickly, take it out, and then we have a perfectly half coated banana. I was listening to a podcast, it's called Off Menu. James Acaster is one of the hosts of that. Anyway, him and Louis Theroux started talking about toasted almonds. They realized that toasted almonds go with everything. There's nothing that you can think of which doesn't go well with toasted almonds. On my pasta, in my sandwiches, in my coffee, on top of soup, they go with everything. And I think some sprinkled on top of the waffles, they will be delicious and it'll add a really nice crunch. Waffle and banana with spruce syrup and toasted almonds. That's the menu this morning. Let's do it. Let's make some batter. I'm following a very simple waffle recipe. I'll leave the link to that in the description of this video. 225 grams of flour. One tablespoon of sugar. A little bit of salt. Mix it up. One egg. 250 milliliters of milk. 50 grams of butter. I just melted that on the stove and then let it cool down. And then mix it all up. It's basically the same as pancake mixture or batter that you'd use for a fish when you're cooking up fish and chips. Waffle mixtures come in many different forms. In fact, I saw a recipe the other day which uses yeast. So you actually rise a dough like with bread, but instead of putting it in the oven, you put it in a waffle maker. But today we're keeping things simple. It's good, I think. I used to have a very bad habit of eating raw stuff. I'd make pastry for a pie and end up eating it all before we'd even cooked it. Same with pancake batter, because it kind of tastes all right. This is a waffle iron. It's made of two parts. It's cast iron, which means 
I think that it was molten iron and they poured it into a mold to create this beautiful piece of cookware. Cast iron is really heavy, but apparently it lasts a long time. It takes a long time to heat up, but it also holds temperature very well too. So you can get it to the right temperature and actually take it off the heat for a bit and it keeps cooking just fine. And apparently it heats up very evenly throughout the whole piece. So we're gonna get these on the stoves and heat them up. I used this cast iron waffle maker for the first time back in England a couple of months ago and it didn't exactly go to plan. Half an hour later and I've got my waffle out of the waffle iron. And there it is. It's a waffle, just the pieces of the waffle aren't in the correct order. There's the first waffle I've ever made in my life and there is the second waffle I've ever made in my life. I can't wait to be in the hut in the mountains and spend the morning waffle making. I realise you just need to add enough butter to make the waffles not stick, otherwise it can just go terribly wrong. And we're going to put this iron on top. I really don't know how this is going to turn out. We've got to remember to cook it both sides. Let's have a little peek. Wow! Looks like a waffle. Oh, look at that. Oh, ho, we made a waffle. Let's make another one. Oh, ho. And over here, my almonds are starting to go brown. Toasted almonds. Let's do some decorating. Make it look all nice. So here we have the much worked for spruce syrup. And these I'm quite excited about. Good morning. I've just taken some photos so I can now remove these. Makes it look nice though, doesn't it? For a, for a thumbnail of the video. To entice people in to click on my video. Here we go, time to be a food critic. There is something rather classy about that. When I put that in my mouth, the caramel that's coating the banana just shatters. I am super happy about how they turned out. Pretty average. There's nothing special about these waffles. Toasted almonds on top. Absolute game changer. I'm rather pleased with my creation today. The caramel bananas could definitely be improved with a more consistent coating around the edge. That would definitely up the game. Caramelization is a really amazing thing. And I had never really appreciated it much until I actually made caramel myself. It's fascinating how sugar and caramel are basically the same thing. Just the heat being added causes a crazy thing to happen and changes the flavor massively. Thanks for watching the video. Let me know in the comments what you think I should try cooking next. I'm open for suggestions. Have a good day and I'll see you soon. Mmm. Bye bye.